Steelers will finish dead last in the AFC North in 2021. What if I told you they'd win the AFC North in 2021? You'd buy either one, wouldn't you? You'd accept, eh, not accept, but at least see as plausible that it could happen. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Steelers. Comes your way bright and early every weekday morning, always new, right here. If you're into hockey and or baseball, I also offer up Daily Shots of Penguins and Pirates, the other two teams I cover. I'll be covering the Steelers minicamp this week at Heinz Field. That begins tomorrow, and yes, I said that correctly. It's at Heinz Field this year the Steelers held their rookie camp and their OTAs where they've always been over on the south side at the practice facility but they had a pretty good experience with their main training camp being at Heinz Field last year and Mike Tomlin and all concerned wanted to keep it involved this year so they'll be over there for that my understanding is that they'll still head out to Latrobe at least for a time to open the regular training camp and then eventually work their way back down here into the city at some point maybe sooner rather than later compared to when they've done it in the past I'm looking forward to it I'm not gonna lie even though I you know I've seen OTAs and I know that this isn't any more decisive when it comes to, you know, how the roster is going to shake out or anything like that. It's it's still really, really light football fare. But it's not voluntary. Everyone's got to be there. We're going to get our first looks at a few guys. And more important than that, maybe more important than anything Over the coming week, we're going to get to see more of this offense and how it involves Najee Harris. And oh yeah, by the way, they have Najee Harris now. That's a real thing. The Steelers drafted Najee Harris. They have him as part of their offense. And the reason I offer this glib observation is that You would think, based on a lot of the prognostications that are out there, and there are so, so, so many when it comes to football, not just mainstream media, but blogging and everything else, everyone's got a listing. And yes, the Steelers do show up anywhere from first to fourth, and most commonly, they show up lower than they do higher you're more likely to see them at third or fourth than anywhere else. It's always some flip of Baltimore-Cleveland up top, and then every once in a while someone gets all geeky about Joe Burrow being back and you know having some additional weapons, and the Bengals are just going to suddenly rise up as if. I'm not here to dissect the Ravens or the Browns or especially not the Bengals, and say, oh, they're going to be this or that compared to where they were last year. I don't cover those teams other than twice a year. But when I look at the Steelers and I look at what they were for that playoff game against Cleveland, I'm not talking about the outcome. I'm not talking about the snap into the end zone, the multiple interceptions. I'm just talking about the roster. Nothing other than the roster, okay? Okay. When I look at that team that was held in pretty high regard by a lot of people, including on the theoretical outside, that didn't really surprise very many observers when it won the AFC North, I ask myself, what would have changed so dramatically from the composition of that roster to where they are now that they would just plummet 
like that in a division that they and the Ravens have alternated owning for the better part of two decades now. What would have changed? What big thing would have occurred? You can say Bud Dupree. That's an easy answer. And you know what? It might end up being the correct one because obviously they went one and five after Bud went down, even though there were a ton of other variables that went into that. It still happened. 11 and 0 with Bud, 1 and 5 without him. Bud was the piece of the Jenga puzzle that you couldn't afford to pull out. Or, or you could actually go back and look at how Alex Highsmith performed, how often he succeeded in winning his pass rush, which was 16.7% of the time higher than Bud's 15.4%. And you can say, listen, th- th- this might not be the most even trade-off, but it's it's close. It's got to be at least close. Is that it? It can't be. Mike Hilton? I mean, look, nobody respected the guy, admired him, actually really, really liked him more than I did, but Don't tell me that Mike Hilton drops you into last place by leaving. Steven Nelson? Well, there are currently 32 teams that don't have Steven Nelson signed to a contract. What else happened? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Najee Harris was drafted. This portion of Daily Shot of Steelers is brought to you by... The personal injury law firm of Luxembourg, Garbett, Kelly, and George, LGKG. They represent people who are hurt in car accidents, who need assistance with workers' comp, who filed medical malpractice claims. The attorneys at LGKG have been designated super lawyers, capital S, capital L, for over 15 years. That's reserved for the top 5% of all attorneys in Pennsylvania. LGKG has offices in Cranberry, Newcastle, Beaver Falls, Butler, and Elwood City, or you can learn more about them online at lgkg.com. See, here's my thing. If you want to point to Bud slash Hilton slash Nelson as being the dominant change in the Steelers from last season to this coming season... I'm going to counter that the actual biggest change the Steelers will have made is to their running game because they acquired a running back who is almost universally projected, I should add, by most of these same prognosticators to be the offensive rookie of the year in 2021. I'm not kidding. You could go through these things, you, these lists of predictions, and you'll see this and that for the standings. And then you'll see Offensive Rookie of the Year, Najee Harris, comma, Pittsburgh. Whoa. <laughs> Which is it? Which is it? Or are you laying everything, everything on the offensive line? Are you saying that the offensive line is going to be the thing that drags the Steelers down? Because you don't recognize as many of the names. Because if you're doing that, then you're doing so without actually watching how they performed. Which, by the way, is how most people analyze offensive lines. If you think that because losing Marquise Pouncey, that the Steelers' offensive line is going to crumble, I would ask you politely, respectfully to look at Marquise's film from 2020. Not the snap, not the, I mean, that happens to anybody. I'm just talking about overall in the running game. These guys had no push. They had no push. Alejandro Villanueva had no push, other than if you count all the times he was getting pushed back. Matt Filer wasn't particularly effective either. If he was, we wouldn't have all been glowing about Kevin Dotson, who looked as if he landed from another planet with the run blocking he was able to pull off when he was inserted for Filer because of injury. 
I happen to feel that this offensive line will be better than the one last year. I don't think it'll be great. I definitely don't think it'll be uh, experienced enough, meaning not just in the NFL, but also with each other, to just instantly click. But I'll take an offensive line that's at least willing and enthusiastic about run blocking, especially when I went out and added a running back. This, to me, is a much, much bigger deal than the losses on the defensive side. It just is. But the Steelers are just plummeting down those things. This is this is the this is the sort of thing that leads to those memes that you find online about Cleveland fans celebrating championships in May. They're really, really, really good at that sort of thing. When we come back, just one question. just one question and today's comes from Greg Tony, who asks KBK hey, okay, the Steelers and Pirates stadiums are both reaching 20 plus years old how time flies is there talk about any new stadiums or are the current ones still considered state of the art I'll focus on Heinz Field not only because this is a football show but because PNC Park is in uh, immaculate shape it just is. The, the people there do a, a tremendous job, led by Dennis Dupre, in keeping it clean, modern, and everything else. They're going to need a new scoreboard there at some point, but uh, with the size of the crowds the Pirates get, in general, it's going to be a while till it would need any sort of expansion or anything like that. Heinz Field is similarly maintained. Jim Sacco and his staff over there, uh, they have a different kind of challenge because they don't have nearly as many events. So all of their concentration comes when both the Steelers and Pitt play there in the fall, and they have to maintain not only the grounds, which get a lot of the attention and the publicity, but the bricks-and-mortar aspect as well. The answer to your question, Greg, is no. Neither of them is is going to need any kind of uh, replacement. I can't even bring myself to say it. I mean, they're both in tremendous shape, and they both still serve their purposes. And remember that it was only four years ago that the Steelers did the expansion at Heinz Field by building up the dreaded open end, as it used to be called, and adding another close to 4,000 seats there in front of the big ketchup bottle scoreboard. Uh, There's a different discussion to be had as it relates to Heinz Field anytime the Super Bowl comes up. And that's the only reason that if it sounds like I've been dot, dot, dotting this whole dialogue, that's why. Uh, Because I have heard different concepts brought up as it relates to the Super Bowl. The Roonies have always wanted to host a Super Bowl in Pittsburgh. And when you look around and you see places like East Rutherford, New Jersey, and Minneapolis and Detroit, um, Indianapolis, getting getting games, especially the one in New Jersey because it was outdoors, you can get a little bit cringy about the stadium that you've got. Because that was the one that showed, hey, you can do this in a northern city and you don't need to have a dome. You don't need to have climate control. Now, Heinz Field itself could absolutely hold a Super Bowl, meaning from uh, needs that would have to be met with the media, uh, places to put tons of satellite trucks and all the other stuff that goes into that. Um, if you can do that sort of thing at a rickety old place like Miami or the Superdome and, and those ones that are always on the tour, it seems, Tampa's another one. It's not that old, but it's not that great either. 
then Heinz Field belongs in that discussion. But maybe, maybe, just maybe there will be a point, and it won't be for, I don't think, for quite a while, where the Steelers say, hey, you know, listen, everybody else is doing this, this, and this, and this, and they get Super Bowls. Uh, you know, what are we going to do here? I don't ever want to see indoor football uh, in Pittsburgh, and I don't think we ever will. I don't really want to see a gigantic retractable dome uh, directly across the point from downtown Pittsburgh. I think that would hurt our overall look. But would it hurt more than 68,000 yellow seats? I don't know. I don't know. There's things I would do with Heinz Field myself, but that's another discussion for another day. No, they're not in any kind of they're not in any kind of jeopardy. Neither the football nor the baseball stadium. I appreciate the question, Greg. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. We'll do another one tomorrow before the opening of Minicamp. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to our DK Pittsburgh Sports channel and don't forget to hit the bell to get notified every time we post a new video or podcast.